everybody. Okay, hi. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeff Tarcio. I'm the um, chairman of the Hingham Business Council in Hingham. And uh, this morning, we've got a uh, conversation with the candidates, which uh, will involve uh, the candidates for the 3rd Plymouth District uh, for the House uh, up on Beacon Hill. I've got the challenger, uh, Kristen Root, is uh, far uh, left of mine, excuse me, of yours. And then uh, Joan Moschino is the incumbent um, who is from uh, Hull. Uh, what we're going to do this morning is it's going to be more of a conversation format. I have a situation um, not where I'm the moderator so much, but rather a facilitator. Um, with less than a month to the election, I figured that the two candidates um, have their talking points down and a lot of people have been exposed to those. What I'd like to do today is to have a goal to have them be able to um, speak to voters and express uh, what their positions are more in a conversation format if that's possible. What I'll do as the facilitator is ask questions of each of you and then um, reserving the right to follow up but to see if um, I can start a conversation where we can advance it a little uh, more deeply than just my you know, answering questions and getting, uh, getting answers in response. I'd like to thank uh, Harbor Media, Media for uh, filming this and producing this um, this morning. Also, um, Comprehensive Benefit Administrators has been um, sponsoring uh, the program this year uh, for the uh, South Shore Chamber, of which the Business Council is an affiliate, and we appreciate that. Um, my name is, uh, again, Jeff Tarcio. I'm the uh, chairman of the Hingham Business Council. I live in Hingham. I've been here for 30 years, and um, with uh, me directing is a board. I've got Jim Murphy, also Mark Ryan, and John Mannion, who are here as well. And I'd like to thank Peter Foreman. He's the president and the CEO of the um, Chamber of Commerce. Um, as a facilitator, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first uh, ask uh, each of the candidates to describe um, themselves, their background for people at home uh, who are watching this, and um, go through um, what uh, you know, recent developments have been on the, uh, mm -hmm. on the campaign trail for them. Um, I'm going to ask for about five minutes each, if that uh, makes some sense for you. And then uh, what we'll do is uh, go through some issues. Uh, I'll try to break it down as to general interest that voters have expressed to me, and then see if I can break it down to other um, topics which are of uh, import to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you know, basically um, some business and infrastructure uh, questions that uh, I may uh, push towards you folks. I think we're looking at about 50 minutes, and uh, with that I'm going to ask uh, Kristen if um, you can make uh, your introduction, give us uh, your background of uh, what what you've done, uh, what you bring to um, your candidacy, and uh, what you hope to accomplish uh, through this uh, run for the seat. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you to the Chamber for hosting this, to Harbor Media for filming it. Thank you to my opponent, Joan Moschino, for being here this morning. It should be a very mm -hmm. fruitful discussion in 50 minutes. Um, my name is Kristen Arute. I am a resident of Hingham. I've been in Hingham for 26 years. I have two children that grew up in Hingham and went through the Hingham schools. Um, I have a background in education, in working with our senior population, running a small business, and I'm also president of Hingham Care, so I've done quite a bit of work on the opioid crisis, which is plaguing not just our state, but our country as well. As president of Hingham Cares, um, we are a prevention coalition, and as such, we work very closely with the school system. So we bring in programming um, through the SAD program at Hingham High School. We bring in programming through the DARE program at the Hingham Middle School. Some of the current issues that we're addressing right now have to do with vaping. In addition to the opioid crisis, vaping is something that has been very problematic within the schools, with children of a certain age. Um, and it's certainly something that we can take a look at as a legislature and look at ways that we can um, mitigate some of the issues and concerns that parents and families and schools have with that particular issue. My background in education, um, I am a licensed middle school teacher. Um, I, my uh, subject area of expertise is math. I'm a private math tutor. Um, I've worked in the local school systems as a remedial math instructor. And one of the things that struck me in my time working within the schools is that we spend an awful lot of time and an awful lot of resources on standardized testing. When we talk about funding for programs, whether it's to address substance issues or to address infrastructure issues or to address housing issues, we need to take a look at where our money is currently being spent. The Commonwealth spends 25 to 35 million dollars annually on standardized testing. 
And there's a lot of discussion about the importance of standardized testing, the relevance of standardized testing. Um, I've seen the disruptive nature of standardized testing. It's referred to as high stakes testing for a number of different reasons. One is because of the high stakes nature in which it's implemented. Um, children have, tend to have a lot of anxiety around standardized tests or testing in general. So it's high stakes for them. It's also high stakes in terms of their education. It takes away from classroom teaching time, which means taking away from classroom learning time. Um, and the results of these tests are not even available until the following school year. So students take a test in the spring, and the results don't come back until the following fall, winter of the next year when they've already moved on to the next grade level and into a different teacher's classroom. So the results kind of render themselves a little bit useless, quite frankly. So I would like to see us take a closer look at that 25 to $35 million and see if we can redirect that, direct it to something that's a little more um, useful. Um, my background working with seniors, I have been managing the personal, legal, and financial affairs of an elderly woman with Alzheimer's for the past four years. When I stepped in to help her out initially, I discovered that she was the victim of financial fraud. Um, it's a very complex case for someone who doesn't have a financial background. It was very challenging to find the appropriate attorney to um, take this case to fruition. Um, it was also challenging for financial people to really truly examine and determine the damages in this particular case. So it was a four-year battle, um, and I have to say it's something that's indicative of my personality. I am tenacious, and I am hardworking, and this is something that really struck me as an injustice that needed to be righted, and I didn't let it go until we saw it to fruition. So one thing that I would like to explore is ways that we can tighten up our elder abuse statute to protect seniors from financial fraud. Um, it's certainly not just the senior population that's exposed to financial fraud and other types of fraud, um, but they are certainly the most vulnerable. Um, my background in small business, I ran a small business for 13 years, and what I discovered through that is that if we are over-regulating business and creating these barriers to entry or barriers to growth, um, then we're doing ourselves and our communities a disservice. So as a, as a member of the state legislature, I would like to take a look at um, any onerous red tape that creates those barriers to entry, anything that would prohibit someone from entering a particular business or maintaining that business, um, and bringing experts to the table. I'm certainly no expert on every industry. I do have a broad and varied background, but I can't speak to every specific industry and all the ins and outs. But I love talking with people. I love getting to the root of the problem. Um, and I love having those conversations with educated individuals. And that's certainly something that I would do. Um, I've been in Hingham for 26 years, like I mentioned. I grew up here in Norwell, been on the South Shore my entire life. So this area is very close, very near and dear to my heart. I've seen lots of changes in terms of housing. I've seen lots of changes in terms of infrastructure. And I've had lots of conversations with people on the campaign trail. Um, I've knocked on, personally, around 3,000 doors and had countless conversations. As a matter of fact, just yesterday I was talking with somebody in Cohasset who's very concerned about the condition of Route 3A in particular. He said, why can't we do something to address the pothole issues and the damage to our roads? Um, he said, please make that a priority. And that's, he's not the first person to mention roads and infrastructure to me. Um, certainly water as a resource is something that we need to be concerned about. Our fragile environment, making sure that we're taking that into account as well as we talk about issues regarding infrastructure and development. Um, and again, that means bringing members of the community to the table and key players to the table and having those important conversations and looking at issues from all different aspects. And that's something that I enjoy doing, and that's the way I operate, and that's something that I would do as a member of the state legislature. So Excellent. thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And uh, Joan, why don't I ask uh, you to introduce yourself and, and tell us uh, what, what you've been accomplishing and what uh, you're looking forward to accomplishing. if you're reelected. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here today. Uh, so I am State Representative Joan Moschino. Uh, it is my privilege to represent and to serve um, Hingham Hull, Cohasset, and North Situate. Um, the first year has gone tremendously well, and we have actually accomplished quite a lot. Uh, I have been a tireless advocate on Beacon Hill for the things that really matter to the South Shore. At the top of the list is 
uh, increasing state local aid to our communities. Um, so things like roadways, um, schools, bridges, seawalls. Um, opiate, finding the comprehensive solutions to the opiate addiction crisis. Uh, and in fact, we've um, just passed the CARE Act uh, around the promote prevention work um, to really fund and to, to support all of the community supports, um, some of which uh, my opponent was talking about earlier. Um, comprehensive solutions to sea level rise and climate change and the frequent coastal storms. Uh, and in fact, uh, I was very proud to participate in and to really push for um, the environmental bond bill, um, which the governor came down and announced uh, here in Situate, uh, was really uh, quite a piece of legislation that really changed things from just um, uh, coming in after the fact and emergencies and really pushed it towards thinking about how we prevent these things for shore protection vulnerability assessments is really quite exciting uh, transition a shift in the way that state government talks about these things and of course economic development at the root of everything that we do um, you know if we're going to make for strong communities it's the kinds of strategies and investments that state government can make in our towns that really give us either the tools or the infrastructure that really welcome the appropriate kinds of um, business whether it's small or large uh, that's appropriate to our village to our village centers if you will um, so it's been quite exciting to be part of all of that policy making um, but as I had told you from the, the very the first moment that I ran one of my top priorities is constituent services and in fact we've helped over 300 people um, not just the quick call one off the actual call my office to help me navigate the resources at state government that really make a difference in the lives of of the folks that live here uh, and that's everything from the handicap placard that just lets the senior uh, or the disabled person park closer to do the grocery shopping all the way up to um, things like mass health or unemployment benefits uh, and as and quite frankly there's a lot of issues that we can't solve um, housing for seniors being one of them affordable housing um, but it's been really tremendous to work with individuals um, I have office hours five times every month somewhere in the district uh, we're trying to meet people where they're at um, so sometimes it's the senior center in Hull and in, in Cohasset sometimes it's the library in Situate and in Hingham and of course we go to Linden Ponds because they just deserve our respect to go there and uh, to be present um, I have a wonderful working relationship with all of my four towns and in fact um, we did bring home a budget I'm very proud of the budget that we um, put forward this year you know it's a bipartisan effort it's across the aisle working hard to bring things and to do things for the folks in our district and in fact this year we had the highest levels of state aid both around um, school budgets um, around local aid itself around libraries although there's more work to be done there to protect our library services um, road pavings um, and in in fact, we did actually pave uh, Route 3, long stretches of Route 3A this year. Um, but also on the grant applications, our communities are working hard. They're all professionally staffed. They have we have tremendous initiatives and programs and progress going on in our districts. And it's been really exciting to be part of that and to get up onto Beacon Hill, to work with Senator O'Connor, to really advocate for some of the budget, of, excuse me, some of the grant monies that have been coming down here. In particular, um, the Seaport Economic Council, um, and I just I heard, just heard the uh, Lieutenant Governor actually present yesterday on a new piece of it. This time, instead of just infrastructure, now what they're doing is they're actually looking towards innovation grants, which was really kind of an exciting new way um, to see the administration envision um, those investments in our district. And I happened to be in situate yesterday uh, for one involving uh, mass lobstermen's and um, and they're trying to, it, it's a really exciting program that I will not do justice to describing, but basically using the fishing traps themselves as almost like a cloud net for gathering information. It's really, really fascinating stuff. Um, but that Seaport Economic Council, they revised idolized it and those are the economic investments where they understand the intersection of 
government's role, investing in our communities, um, but also through that economic lens. And so sometimes that's seawall money, um, most recently for Hull and for Situate, but it's also economic empowerment money. Um, you know, I think about um, Hingham, we're in Hingham today, so it's the Bathing Beach, Barnes Wharf, all of these different initiatives, um, Cohasset and the Harbor. Uh, and those are just a handful of examples of the kind of grant dollars that we've been able to bring back um, this term into um, into our into our communities. It's been really exciting to be part of that. I guess the message I would just uh, leave everyone with is that no one has or will work harder uh, than I have to really get to know the community, to understand the fabric of the community, um, you know, countless meetings, working with the, with the selectmen, working with the planning board members, working with the school committees, um, you know, just on all of these initiatives, walking the district, uh, as my opponent referenced. It's really a great way to just introduce yourself, hear what people want to know and, the, and what they're really interested in and what's important to them. Uh, and it's exciting and interesting. Um, it's absolutely been my pleasure to serve you, this community, for these past two years. I'm absolutely excited and uh, jazzed to run again for re-election. And I guess I would just say to you that I wake up every single day thinking about what I can do as your state representative to make things better for the lives of the folks that live here in Hingham Hall, Cohasset, North Situate. So uh, just humbly ask for your vote on November 6th, and I look forward to serving the community and the next session. Great. Thank you very much. So you both um, you both touched on some issues that are near and, and dear to you that um, you went through, what you've been involved uh, with. Um, I guess, Joan, the first question, what's the number one issue to you um, that's facing the district? and um, what should be done uh, to solve that issue? So I, I think the number one issue is climate change and sea level rise, um, the frequent intense coastal storms and flooding. Um, this is the thing that in the immediate is going to hit us the hardest and the long term, the flooding. Um, so I, I am delighted and very proud to work um, you know, across the aisle with Senator O'Connor and the administration to really um, start to invest in the community. Um, so if you'll, if you notice what they've done over this past session was they shifted, as I mentioned, their thinking about um, about what that means for not just the coastal communities. We're talking coastal communities because that's where we live, uh, but inland communities should be thinking about this as well. But it's the vulnerability assessments, and that was the grants that came out um, that all of our communities have done. But now what we need to do is to and we understand that and it's been a robust process but now what we do is need to take that off the shelf and start to implement around it and the vulnerability assessments aren't just you know is the sewer plant and hull going to get washed away in the next coastal storm because it's right there on the on the on the rock um Rocky Beach, but it's more uh, do we have a plan for seniors and how they might be evacuated, where are the warming shelters? I mean, it's robust planning. Um, but we need to do is now, we've got the planning, we need to start taking that off. And so I was able to get $500,000 into the environmental bond bill that will actually allow Hingham, Hull, Cohasset, and Situate to do the planning regionally so that we're not just doing these things in isolation, but that we're working across town lines to support each other. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is really working very closely with um, with uh, the state level, with EOPS, around what are the uh, investments that we need to make here. So if we are, say, Hurricane Michael, we're making its way up here, we have seasoned, experienced um, professionals who do our emergency management, but we also have established good working relationships with the state police, the National Guard, to bring those resources down and to make sure, uh, because you can't bring them everywhere, so they have to be targeted where they're going to be most needed, and we've been very effective uh, managing to get those down here to protect the people. So there's the public safety component, there's the regional planning component, and then I should just take a moment to say also that as the storm season is coming, uh, individuals should also be thinking about what are the resources for them. So do you know where your warming shelters are? Or do you have the batteries in your home? You know, things that we need to do to prepare for the winter season are coming up as well. Um, and then just lastly, the other piece I would say is that you don't get to ask 
for millions of dollars in seawall money without then working on the public policy issues. And so this year we passed the clean energy legislation which increased the RPS and that's just the renewable portfolio standard and that's important to us because it's the state saying to ISO New England that you should procure more renewable energy sources um, for your electric production. So when you plug in the cell phone or you plug in the, um, the electric vehicle, um, instead of it coming from dirtier fuels like oil or coal or even gas, it will now we're going to grow towards a, a larger portfolio share around renewable things like wind and solar. And in fact, um, we did just put out procurement around the wind farms offshore. Uh, the SMART program just came out of the administration, uh, replacing SREX to try to bolster more uh, growth around um, solar. And this is all actually really good for us, both because it means for healthy, clean environment, but this also means jobs. And it's a growth in the innovation technology for us, and especially as a district where we are highly educated um, and have a lot of opportunity for startups and innovations. All good for us. It's a win-win. Well, I see, for example, um, when I look at the district and I look at the communities, I also look at, um, at Hull and what the investment from 2014, where you've got the, um, the state funds going into Nantasket Nantas Boulevard and the investment that's happening there now that's with right. fascination. That's right. um, I also look at what's happened in Cohasset as far as you talk about inland, um, but inland of the coast, the James River uh, right. culvert. Yes. And now they've got, mm -hmm. I mean, FEMA's identified that culvert as mm -hmm. being, you know, representing the 100 year storm just within the culvert itself. Right. Um, any uh, any interaction between uh, yourself and any of those investments and um, so anytime um, the towns are working with the states the senator and I are always involved um, both for advocating so all of these projects um, they, they rise locally our local elected officials are actually doing a great job and we have wonderful expertise and we have very senior people working in our towns so all these projects arise locally what the senator and I are able to do is to identify grant projects but also establish the relationships with each of those agencies agencies and we get in there and we really fight and we advocate we send letters we harass them with phone calls we bring them down for tours we make sure that they understand why this is a priority for our district and why they should elevate these projects it's very competitive these are p competitive grant projects so we are in there every step of the way I'm, elevating those and I'm, being advocates for I'm, them I'm glad that you recognize that because for, for example Senator um, O'Connor has been very helpful in other communities Yes. Um, I think of Barrel House Z over in Weymouth yes. was extremely yes. helpful yep. and um, that that's very important very yeah. important um, and so we also fight projects too so <coughs> think about the compressor station um, and that has been um, a, a multi-town um, and uh, straight up on environmental impacts and public safety right. uh, and we coordinate very closely the senator um, and our my my um, counterpart uh, representative Jamie Murphy uh, who actually represents one precinct in Hull, in Hingham. Um, and we work very closely together, um, not just to bring money down into the district, but also to fight off the projects that we and don't for want. for folks, that's the compressor station proposed next to the Four River Bridge yes. over in Weymouth off yes. of uh, Bridge Street. Yes, that has, they're doing the environmental assessment impact right now. Right. Um, and um, we're really pushing them to do a public safety impact uh, because the gas line goes right under the abutment on the southern side of the bridge within 20 feet. And we've, uh, we've uh, sadly, tragically, we've witnessed what overpressurization does um, in, on the North Shore. So, yeah, so we're fighting on that one as well. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Kristen, uh, same question for you. Um, what, what you see as the number one issue facing the district, um, just number one, and what should be done about it? What can you do uh, to solve that uh, issue or we'll work on the issue? I would have to say, <clears throat> excuse me, it's infrastructure. So to sort of uh, lob on to some of the things that Representative Moschino has said, certainly seawall infrastructure, our roadways, as I've already mentioned, um, our uh, sewer systems, um, those are all important things that we need to be taking into consideration, not just for development and proposed development, but also for um, our current residents. Um, and with respect to storm damage, um, I was contacted by a group, actually a group at the uh, right in your neighborhood, at the bottom of the street. Um, 
at Allerton Beach at the end of um, the Alphabet Streets in Hull. They reached out to me, yep, V Street. They reached out to me last February and asked me to come down and take a look at the the damage that had been done to the the um, the uh, seawall at the end of the street that um, due to neglect, due to 15 years of neglect, um, there was quite a bit of debris that had built up. And as a result, there were stones, large stones that were considered rubble. They were, they were not large enough to be considered problematic according to um, state regulation, but they were certainly large enough to do damage. And so this group of neighbors asked me to come down and take a look. I stood out in the cold with them for two hours. They showed me pictures of what the area used to look like. They talked about damage to their homes. They talked about spending their own personal money um, to clean up their yards, to clean up uh, underneath where debris had washed underneath their homes. Um, they also talked to me about the, uh, the fight that they've had on their hands for the past 15 years, trying to get the state and trying to get the town uh, elected officials to do something about this particular issue. It was turning into a safety issue, certainly a health issue. Um, and they reached out to me and I went down and I spoke with them. I connected them with the Marshfield Coastal Coalition, Joe Rossi's group, which is now the Massachusetts Coastal Coalition. Um, he was able to put them in touch with an environmental specialist who assessed the damage, assessed the area, and helped them draft a proposal that they presented to um, the town and that went forward to the Department of Environmental Protection and was recently approved. So that beach is going to be, part of that beach anyway, is going to be cleaned up within the next few months over the fall. So that should be tremendous for them, for that one little section of Hall, it will be tremendous for them over the next um, several months as we enter into storm season and hopefully we don't have a season like we did last year. Um, I've also spoken with people about seawall breaches. Um, there was another neighborhood right around the corner on the bay side where the seawall breached and people have lost their homes. People were, um, people were forced to go to hotels. People were forced to have friends or family members take them in for months on end while they worked with FEMA and they worked with their insurance companies to try and have this damage to their homes um, remedied and some of these are ongoing issues some of these these homes are certainly vulnerable given their location um, but the seawalls that are there to protect them for one thing are not tall enough and for another have like I mentioned have breaches have 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 spots where they're incredibly vulnerable and so the homes that are on the other side are susceptible to um, having um, issues and for people who live in the district for people who own homes a home is a one of your largest investments. So if something, if your home is not protected, if there's damage done to your home, that's going to impact um, your livelihood and your future. A lot of seniors choose to stay in their homes um, and age in place. And if they can't do that in a healthy way, um, then that's you know something that we need to be looking at to remedy. So, Chris, so looking forward, what um, th those are all excellent constituent services um, type reactions now, but looking forward. If you're able to get the seat, what um, what what should you do to prevent you know going forward as far as you know longer term fixes to these? Is it increased funding? Is it is it a different concentration of um, of of efforts and resources? What it's do you a, it's see? A, I would imagine it's a combination of both. It's also exploring unique options to mitigate storm damage, whether it's revetments. Um, you know, offshore revetments or, um, you know, uh, certainly the beach cleanup is something that if we do beach grooming that will um, mitigate some of the damage caused by these storms because there'll be less debris to wash up onto the, onto the shoreline and onto people's um, properties. So I think it's, it's a matter of looking at each community as a very unique community. So we would be, you know, one of us would be representing the district. However, the issues that impact the residents of Hall are very different from the issues that impact the residents of Cohasset. Cohasset doesn't have much of a problem in terms of storm damage. They have a more protected harbor. Um, so the issues there are much different from um, Hull, certainly from Hingham. Um, so I would say that Situate and Hull are the most vulnerable when it comes to storm damage. So I think it's a matter of working with the local communities, local officials, identifying those issues that are of importance, 
and um, ensuring that money is funneled back to those communities so it can be used in the in the most productive way. It's also a matter of bringing the players, other players, to the table in terms of the federal government, state government, and local officials, as well as property owners. One of the issues that um, we have in terms of repairing our seawalls is that some people own their property down to the low water mark. And that means that they own a portion of a seawall. Some of a seawall may be owned by the state. Um, certainly the federal government can come in and assist with um, any kind of seawall um, infrastructure issues. So there are some very complex issues pertaining to deed and ownership rights that need to be addressed. But it's a matter of digging in, rolling up your sleeves, bringing those people to the table, and having those important conversations. And that's what I did in Hull. Excellent. I'm impressed that you both um, brought up, you know, basically the, you know, the um, climate change, right, is what we see when we talk about, you know, the seawalls and elevating um, water levels and coastal damage. We all just read the UN panel on climate change report um, warning that if um, changes aren't made, you know, within the next 10 years, you know, by 2030, by 2040, um, we could have significant raise, you know, rises in uh, temperatures. Um, expanding this issue, what, um, and I'll ask Joan first, um, what else would be available to people on the, um, the state, on the local level, to, uh, to address this issue, right? Because it's going to be a national issue, and it's going to be uh, affecting so many of us. What can be done on the district level to, um, to do our part? So it's a great question, and it's the question that actually needs to be asked next. Um, so the report that you referenced um, is suggesting that we need to be more aggressive in our greenhouse gas reductions and our climate change policy protections. Um, and Massachusetts actually was a leader, and this is predates uh, myself, but we, we set some pretty rigorous um, goals right. for reduction. And now what we're seeing is that it needs to even happen faster. Um, even setting aside what goals you choose to shoot for, the fact of the matter is is the piece that we need to do is now have a, a plan. And so one of the things that I'll be filing next session is um, a roadmap to a prosperous and a clean energy future. And what it's really asking is for the administration to take the next step and to, to do the back cast to see what we're going to need to do by each of the milestones to have more aggressive milestones uh, and to really put multiple strategies in place, which is to say we were talking earlier about, um, about greening the grid, about procuring more energy through, um, through renewable sources. Uh, in fact, Hull and Hingham both have municipal light plants, right. and Hingham is 100%, which I think is actually pretty impressive. Um, they procure 100% renewable energy. Um, Hull, I think, is at 75%, um, but what I'd really love to see on the local level is the other, there's 51 mun municipal light plants, they should be subject to um, the Global Warming Solutions Act is what it's called in Massachusetts, but they should be subject to all of those requirements, and I would love to see them all start to go there um, on their own without requiring legislation to do it, but if we have to file legislation, we will. Well, I like but the benchmarks. Right, because the half, benchmarks. Right, because half, half the, uh, right. the battle of getting somewhere is being able to articulate mm -hmm. um, something. Right. But then... And that's the, being filed? Uh, I'll file it next term. Oh, good for you. Yes. Um, that'll be something we'll file next term. Um, the other the other two pieces to that is transportation. So one of the big, I think it's 40% of our emissions in Massachusetts actually come from transportation. And so we were talking a little bit earlier about infrastructure. I mean, one of the pieces of infrastructure I think we need to do from a state investment in the local level is public transit. Now, we've secured the ferries. We've gotten we got two new ferries. That's pretty big capital expenditures on the ferries. Um, the, the, it's a great schedule, but it needs to be on the weekends. I was and it say, need, now it's not on the weekends. Right, right, now it's not on the weekends. And it's, it's really crazy. And they need to have that schedule on the weekends. And we've really been leaning on MBTA about and working with them. So now we don't have to worry at least that they'll cancel the ferries. Every time Secretary Pollack sees me, she's like, yes, yes, Joan, I know the ferries. But we need to push to get that on the weekend schedule, and we need it to go to Massport so that we are both for fewer emissions but also less congestion and traffic in the district. And then we have a pretty good um, commuter rail schedule. 
um, it has not been as reliable. Right. We need reliable and it needs to be more robust. Um, so we need to focus on that. And quite frankly, the other piece of it is um, we just need fewer cars on the road. So that we, we really need to focus on like regional transit within the district so that you can get that last mile from my house to the, to the ferry or from the commuter station to you know the downtown centers and things like that. Right. So those are pieces at the local level where we can take responsibility. Because you can't solve, Massachusetts can't solve climate change, but we can take steps around the pieces that are within our ambit of control. Absolutely. We can take steps around ourselves. The last piece of that is actually also um, our, our own homes and our own energy use in the homes. The governor put out a really interesting piece about a home energy audit. And I, I don't think they quite got it right the first time around. But I've spoken to um, Secretary Beaton and about his issue about about that piece and about some of the other legislation I'd like to file. And what I'm hoping is that once they start putting the, the, the paths in place, that that will be another piece of it. Uh, I'd like to see them really focus on that piece because that is also about savings for homeowners Absolutely. because it's about the renewable energy is now affordable energy. And if you're doing things like clean peak shaving, right? The, you're, think about it this way, right? We have a winter storm, the temperatures plunge, and what happens? Our gas and our electric bill spikes. Well, it's because of the way we procure energy. Um, so if we power, if we do it power with energy storage, and we do renewables, which we know are less expensive, then that's savings in everybody's pocket. So it's these kind of intellectual tech things that actually make a difference um, in everybody's lives and everybody's pockets. Um, the other piece I would just say, um, going back to the vulnerability assessment, we didn't really mention um, is the FEMA and the, the FEMA flood maps um, and the CRS program, which is the is how we all get our um, our flood insurance. And so we we need to have accurate maps, and we need those programs to continue through the federal government. And we work with our federal delegation on that. Um, but I would argue that there's a piece in there that's been missing. And if we, so using the last year's storms, um, what I learned was that immediately, you know, I was talking about the coordination of services, the protection, the emergency response, and that's all terrific, and Senator and I will continue to advocate for those resources here. But then after the fact, you know, if you were someone who had coastal inundation flooding, and they took out your, and say, say it just took out your, um, your, your furnace, you can't go back into your home without heat. So, but there's nobody right now that <laughs> focuses on just regular people like us and helping them to say, do a no interest loan. Uh, and, and what I've been talking behind the scenes to some, some friends at DHCD, because there's a similar program that they use. i to get the oh, question now. Yeah, but I that's the thing that I think we need to focus on is how you, how you take care of just regular people. Okay, and so, same question, um, having to do more um, broad-based with, um, you know, just where the issues go beyond just, you know, coastal inundation and uh, resiliency, et cetera. Um, what do you see as um, issues and areas that you could be effective um, at the state level and the district level? You mean in terms of infrastructure? As far as whatever your, um, what you see as additional um, issues that um, would affect, you know, basically the UN uh, Climate Panel um, talks about broad initiatives, broad, you know, needs on a very short timeline. Um, what, uh, what do you see as far as um, what you could affect as a representative from the 3rd Plymouth District? So if we're talking about something on a global scale, I mean, there's certainly... even local, because you answered it um, on the coastal issues. Right. But it, it goes, so the coastal issues are a combination of, you know, cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. So um, going out broader, you talked about earlier with some uh, energy production, et cetera. I mean, are there other uh, more expansive, um, you know, pockets of that uh, issue that you see as achievable? 
Um, well, I certainly think that, um, you know, giving a nod to green energy and to the fact that um, the Hingham Municipal Light Plant is, uh, you know, operating on 100% renewable resources, I think that's tremendous. I mean, I think Ms. Representative Moschino did a very thorough job covering that question, and I would agree with most of her talking points. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to know what has actually been done in the past two years, because this was your platform in 2016, and you have a lot of ideas. What have you done in the past two years in your first term? On the, and I don't mean to be taking over, no, but... Say, no, if, so if, is that... Have you completed your answer? Yes, because I'm, I'm, you know, sitting back and I'm listening, and I appreciate everything that our current state rep has to say, but I have to say I haven't seen much that's actually taking place at the local level. So if, there's, if there have been some initiatives that I've missed, could you uh, sure. fill me in? Um, there's actually some, exci some exciting things. Um, so on the coastal front... So you're going to give her the chance to go back through all the money she just talked about bringing well, back? Well, so the money that she talked about bringing back, I would argue that she potentially didn't have much influence with regard to that money. Senator Patrick O'Connor has been working extremely hard round the clock, and a lot of the talking points that you have, um, a lot of the things that you take credit for are things that other people have actually um, worked very hard on. So. Okay. For example, this beach that I mentioned earlier, Allerton Beach, the reason they reached out to me is because you told them that you were too busy. So that is not true at well, all. Well, that's what I was told by the okay, person who we'll reached out to you. So that was not true at all. And in fact, um, so, okay, so that's not true at all. So in fact, um, there are a number of residents that live along that section from mm -hmm. about, I would say about really U Street down to X Street, mm -hmm. and it's a hot spot. It's, um, what's happened is the uh, point has sort of rounded off in all these coastal storms, and now it's kind of coming in right in there. Uh, and in fact, um, the, the Conans did reach out to me, and in fact, the grant that you're talking about that they got is one that we were able to get um, through um, the environmental affairs, and in fact, I was right there when Secretary Beaton announced the grant, and what it does is actually there were three pieces of it that came to our district. One is to uh, elevate all of the electrical equipment above the floodplain at the sewer plant um, for Hull, because uh, that's that's a, a, that's been a long-standing problem. So they're elevating all the electrical, so it will continue to perform. One was for this beach berm. Um, for the town, and it included a th authorization. This is actually quite controversial for the town to have the authorization to come in and actually scrape the beach um, and to dig out the trench and to put this berm in there. Right. Uh, and, and I'm asking what what you what was your role in all of that? Because my understanding for the grant. My understanding is that you had nothing to do with that. So, all right, well, you can talk to anyone you want, but... I have spoken to people, and I've been very actively involved with this particular but, so group guess, of residents. So, what you're so. focusing on is... But if we're talking about constituent on, services and bringing people to the right. table... So, your focus today is, what you've mo mentioned is, I've done the following, you know, I called this person back, I picked up, you know, I helped them with rocks, et cetera. So, what my questions to you are, and, and I think what people are, are interested when they go to the ballot box within you know a month I think what people are looking at is what what is each of the candidates you know the track record is important but what what are your ideas what should be done because that's that's what I'd like to know if I'm if I'm tuning in and I'm taking a look at this I mean I, I, I don't want this to devolve to you know did you go and pick up rocks well, no, like, I'm not, so I'm that's my so I'm giving the conversation to evolve but I'm opportunity yes. to you know you're running for the seat of Jones the incumbent, I guess the question is, you know, the question is, are you going to bring something different, different ideas, different efforts, different approaches to the seat? I think that's what people want to hear. So to keep this, Absolutely. keep this constructive, yes. if, if I don't want to get into he said, she said, again, my focus but if is, we're, if we're talking what, about are your, this particular what are your issue. ideas as, as we, as we go forward? And that's what I'm trying right. to do. I'm trying to give, I'm trying to give you mm -hmm. the platform and the spotlight to look into the camera and say, this this is what my plan is, and my right. question specifically was, you know, the, the the report that came out on if we don't do something quickly, right between now and 2030, right. we're going to be in it deep. So that's that I think is what people want to hear, right? You know, so 
the, so that's that that was the basis of my giving me the opportunity to ask that question and I, I appreciate think. that however my conversations with people at the very local level ha don't have to do with climate change per se it has to do with storm damage people are very concerned about damage to their property they're very concerned about making sure that their property is protected um, as I mentioned it's a, the largest investment for many many people so I think people are more tuned into the results and the repercussions of what we're talking about globally so if we're talking in theory and we're talking about doing some you know some changes statewide that's wonderful but my issue my concerns my time will be best spent addressing those very immediate concerns that people have because we can talk about renewable energy which I think is wonderful and we absolutely should be having those conversations we can talk about um, you know water lines needing to be um, you know further below the surface certainly in Hull I mean there's a real issue with um, wasted water in Hull because those pipes need to be running at all times but when we're talking about very specific things and very specific needs that people in the community have it's as a result of all of these storms it's as a result of the potential exposure that they have well, so let's do this why don't we talk about that project in particular? I do not think that three hundred thousand dollars is an insubstantial amount of money. No one said for, that. Uh, for me no to advocate that. for to bring back to our district, and as for that particular project, so as a state representative, it's really about bringing it all back to the district. Yes, um, absolutely. And, and Senator O'Connor has done a wonderful job in doing that. The well, hollow I'm trolley is a perfect example to glad increase tourism that you in Hull. I think so. Yes. Um, but we're talking no, it's not, about it's being not the state thinking representative. Something. Yes. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's also about follow through, Kristen. So that's right. On this project in is. particular, do you know how it resolved? It hasn't yet resolved because, in fact, I, ha I, I spoke with and met with, so I'm not sure who you're talking to, but I've been talking to the Conans um, about this project, and they've been organizing a small group of the people there, and it hadn't taken any steps forward. That's right, and for 15 years. And I looked behind <laughs> the, the scenes to find out what it was and was able to suggest some and this is actually more of a, a role for a selectman and less for a state rep, but I was able to use my relation, good relationships from being a selectman long time in Hull to work with town council and to work with the town manager. No one even knows that I did this, but I went behind That's the scenes right. no to figure out That's right, no one knows that you did this because you did not make yourself available to this particular group. You may have had a conversation behind the scenes, but your constituents, which is a larger group of people than just one couple that you're referring to, received word from you that you were not available, that you were too busy to have a meeting with them. You didn't attend any conservation committee hearings. You didn't mm -hmm. advocate for them at the state level. It's okay. So, no, I mean, I'm just pointing out what has been told to me, and that's the reason why I was brought in to the so conversation. You can you can regardless what though you want it's or you can about believe action. me and it's about, the fact it's of about matter action is, so, is that so, that's Kristen, not true so at all. Your, your position is you would actually go and you think that the legislator should attend conservation commission meetings. Is I attended one conservation no, committee no, no, meeting. No, no, yes. not not what you've done. But right. if if you were to be elected as the representative from the third no. Plymouth district, no. your role would be nope. to attend conservation commission meetings. Potentially, I mean, if there's a, if there's a large issue that affects the town or affects you know something that is a is a district-wide conversation then certainly but in this particular case this was several months ago this was before I even pulled papers to run I was asked by this group of people to come down and to meet with them and to review um, the situation with the beach and to uh, see if there was something that I could do to help them so one of the things that I did was to attend a conservation commission meeting so that I could see what the conversations um, that were taking place were but I also connected them with a local group that was very um, pivotal very instrumental in ensuring that they um, their needs were addressed so so the role of the state representative I was not state representative at the time right. I would just so like to I remind guess that's you of the question. that it sounds like it, to me I, to me it's a difference between um, kind of reactive and act in, inactive kind of pro, proactive I should say it, it sounds like um, you're proud of your experience in in reacting and being able to assist people in your current role but the question is going to be um, to me if if you are elected I mean are, are you is it going to be a continuation of the reactive present 
you know, present time focus, or is there going to be a, a proactive, um, you know, a proactive look over the next two years as mm -hmm. to as to what you can do, not to just re react to things that are occurring, um, but to actually make a, make a difference so that we can, you know, prevent the storm or the calamity that's going to happen in you know ten years and fifteen years. Right. No, I think it's a combination of both. That's an excellent question. I definitely think it's a combination of both. It's some. It's a combination of preparedness and foresight, and it's also a combination of responding to things. No one anticipated this past year of storms. Certainly no one expected the amount of damage and um, the amount of repeated damage in particular areas. So there is an element of being reactionary because there are people who find themselves in times of need. However, are, the proact- Are we not surprised at, at the numbers that we're seeing now? I mean, it's- I, I don't- we look at the I'm FEMA sure. numbers in their reports, it's- I mean, we're, we're I would say that the, the I would alliance. say residents were caught off guard because residents expect that the infrastructure that's put in place to protect them did not protect them. Okay. Um, so pivoting, if um, I can, uh, one question that uh, we've been working with on this um, South Shore Chamber has to do with workforce housing needs. Mm -hmm. um, they've issued recently a report, uh, the South Shore 2030 Choosing Our Future, which um, really drills down on what our housing um, you know, needs are, what the shortcomings are, and how housing and the development of affordable housing um, has a potential to affect our economic development here on the, uh, on the South Shore. Um, Kristen, I'll ask you first if, um, I'm, I'm sure you've looked at it, you, yes. you attend quite a few chamber events where it's been discussed. Um, what can, or what should you do as the uh, House Representative to, if you agree, to advance um, some of the goals of, uh, of that report? Um, once again, so one thing that I found very interesting in the report was identifying um, ports of transportation, whether it be a ferry port or whether it be um, an MBTA stop or a commuter rail stop, identifying those and considering the possibility of a de development around those. Um, certainly we have traffic issues on Route 3, um, traffic issues all over the place, so it's something that we would want to be able to mitigate. Um, but in terms of bringing workforce down here to the South Shore, encouraging growth of business here on the South Shore, um, encouraging people to patronize local establishments and, um, you know, see that our downtown economies start to flourish. It's a matter of very specifically, very uh, carefully targeting those particular areas where that type of development makes sense. And how would affordability uh, be to work in? Because what, what our uh, members are finding are that um, they can have just flourishing, wonderful businesses on the South Shore, but it's extremely difficult to have the workers um, be able to, you know, frankly afford this area now because of the um, rise in real estate right. um, values, and that that's a, you know that's a critical issue mm -hmm. now, and it portends to you know become more of an issue in the future if um, if some changes aren't made. Do um, do you have any ideas with respect to that issue? Well, I think certainly having more rental property available is some is a, an opportunity for that. Um, what they're uh, putting together down in Weymouth Landing is certainly tremendous right there where the where the tea station is accessible, where restaurants and shops are within walking distance. It's wonderful. Um, I think multi looking at multi-use opportunities where we have a combination of commercial, retail, and residential. Um, those are all wonderful opportunities. Um, and I also think that in addition to the, the workforce housing that we're talking about, we need to take into account the fact that our population is aging. Right. And a lot of people are choosing to age in place. However, I think a great many more people are looking to downsize. I know my parents are kind of on the cusp of that. Um, as a lot of parents of uh, my contemporaries are as well. So bearing in mind that we're not just constructing affordable units for workforce, we're constructing affordable units so people who have outgrown their house or their house has outgrown them can take advantage of those opportunities as well. And it's a great opportunity for aging boomers to free up equity yes. in their homes and then also um, boomers are choosing to work longer and you know are shown to be very productive right. what um, do you have any um, you know insight ideas uh, goals with respect to um, you know affordable uh, housing for folks that may be in the you know 55 and old over what can communities do what can you do to encourage communities to be more receptive to that type of development 
That's a, that's a bit of a challenge um, because decisions like that tend to take place at the local level, the very local level. Um, I know that in Hingham in particular, we have um, – uh, the Lincoln School Apartments, and that the Lincoln School Apartments is affordable housing for our senior population. However, there's a seven-year wait just to get on the waiting list for Lincoln School Apartments. It's a very desirable community. Um, it, it, this is a hyper-local issue, but the Old Ship Church Meeting House, which abuts the back of the Lincoln School Apartments, is something that's been on the market for a number of years. Yeah, for four million dollars. For four right. million dollars, exactly. And um, you know, there's been some back and forth. There've been the proposals about that particular property, but it's a sizable piece of land in addition to having that residence on it as well that's currently being used as the, um, as the meeting house. Selling off the back parcel so that Lincoln School Apartments can expand is something that has been um, discussed. However, the price tag has to be right for the town. And if the price tag isn't right for the town and the town doesn't envision that as a good opportunity, a developer could come in and purchase that parcel themselves and put up you know, two or three large homes. So um, it's a matter of prioritization at the local level, unfortunately. I've with several of said developers. And Have it's you? Di it's difficult because of the historic nature of, yes. um, of, of the structure there. That's, that's what I think people are, are running into. Yes. Um, Joan, I'd ask, um, same, uh, the, uh, the Chambers uh, 2030 looking forward mm -hmm. um, on housing. What, um, what do you see that um, you know, issues are, uh, issues that can be solved? And what can you do uh, in your, you know, the, over the next two years from the district level to uh, influence that uh, discussion and development? So I think we have some wonderful opportunities that um, uh, my opponent allu alluded to uh, around transit-oriented developments. Um, okay. The Greenbush line comes down, and uh, what we know is that if we want to attract workforce um, people, young families, uh, young people to the district, uh, we know that they want that they really like this idea of um, uh, of, of being able to get in and out of the city and place making and these ideas uh, of things that really attract these young professionals um, and interestingly enough also the downsizers as well and so anything we can do around uh, those transit oriented developments um, and to promote them I think would be a great thing for workforce housing the other thing uh, is really giving the tools to the communities around being able to um, to create affordable housing and there's affordable housing with the capital A which um, is all run but then there's also just workforce housing um, that is affordable to working families uh, and the governor had put forward um, a zoning reform bill um, that had a work uh, sort of housing production requirement to it that I think is actually going to be formative for the South Shore. It's not going to impact our particular district as much as all of that. Um, in fact, uh, we've done a pretty good job, especially in Hingham. Um, Hull's mostly built out. There are um, constraints within um, Cohasset and Hingham has already taken a lot of those votes on the local level around uh, meeting their 40B affordable requirements. I thought the selectmen did a great job um, um, authorizing those two um, two projects down by Beale Street, down by by the shipyard, and it's those kinds of things that are really going to be what attracts the workers back to our, our district and that's good for our small businesses because then they have workers that they actually can that are here can afford to get here um, it takes the parking uh, sort of piece out of it and the congestion piece out of it but then it's also good for us because we know that young families like that they stay local and they spend local so it, it really works around all of that but we do need to give our communities the tools that can really um, that, that can really shape the zoning and the planning so that we're attracting the right kind of business and the right kind of housing development that we actually need to meet the needs of our community. And the governor's bill was at the 2017 yes. the, um, mm -hmm. that I think um, one of the one of the elements of that which I thought was attractive was that um, an encouragement to um, mm -hmm. reduce the two-thirds zoning change locally right, from to simple simples and um, yeah. you know to cities and towns, which is more controversial than you'd think. But it's actually, if you talk to planners, it's the piece that they say they do all of the work, and then they they, they can't always get it over the supermajority. Um, but 
I think people need to understand is that zoning is just the rules by which you tell developers you know what is what you're trying to welcome here zoning isn't scary it is it is it's supposed to reflect the individual um, character and nature of the communities and it's just it's just the standardized community development tools which is why need. it's very important that we maintain zoning at the local level as opposed to placing it in the hands of the state which is a, a bill Senate bill 81 actually proposed that um, that the state take over essentially uh, this is not the governor's bill this is a Senate bill that was proposed that the state take over all control of local zoning I think the other piece of it though the Just other so clear the Kristen, other there was a whole the other piece of it this, excuse me I'm talking Joan the other piece of it is that affordability is kind of a moving target and can be redefined depending on the community that you're talking about so for example with the 40 B um, a 40 B in Hingham is a lot less affordable than a 40B in another community because um, the affordability is based on the gross median income, or I'm sorry, the average median income. Um, there are a good number, right. exactly. Right, so, so, so if we're talking about federal guidelines, if we're talking so we're about clear. affordability, we want to make sure that we're talking about things that are actually affordable. So someone who's making minimum wage working at a sandwich shop is not going to be able to afford an affordable unit in Hingham. Um, so do we have that conversation about how to produce more housing to meet the needs of every individual who wants to live and work in a particular community that that opens up a whole new can right. of worms a whole but, new conversation I mean, so it's basically a public private um you know relationship yes. so the developers have to come in they've got to look at the towns they're already under pressure under the, the 40b just at um, you know, eighty thousand dollars, for example, in Hingham is is what that threshold would be exactly. for affordability. Right. Um, are you suggesting that the government should should take on a stronger role to um, to be able to, to to satisfy that housing segment that you just talked about? No, okay. I, I'm All not. Right. No, okay. but okay. I'm. What, I guess the point that I'm making is that affordability, almost at what cost? You know, how far do we go with affordability? Because affordability, as I mentioned, is a moving target. Um, and it's based on the community that, that um, is, is, um, the housing is located in. So affordability at what cost? You know, where do we go? At what lengths do we go to ensure that every single worker who wants to live in a particular community? So there has to be a balance there. There has to be a, a reasonable conversation about what's affordable and, and who's, whose needs do we meet. I'll get the last word on that as we wrap up. I think, um, I think the example that we saw that um, Joan just mentioned in Hingham, that's the Alliance Residential Project. Yes. That, that was an interesting um, situation where the selectmen were balancing that against the Avalon, which was rental, which was 100% counted right. towards the affordability. Right. And they were very much um, had their eyes on the longer term changes in the, in the, you know, basically in the numbers that would open them up and make them susceptible to 40B once again. So they were very forward looking in, um, in addressing that and then also recognizing that a housing development plan will stave off 40B, right. for example. So not to for get hyper, years, right, yes. so not yeah, to get yes. hyper local on Hingham, but I happen to know a lot about right. that Alliance yes. project. Right. Right. Um, so very interesting uh, issues. So I'd like to thank you both. Thank um, you it's, uh, we've got a, a few weeks left to uh, election day. Four weeks. And uh, four weeks and, four weeks um, and Three weeks, six days. Uh, I'm on yesterday time, and um, you've done both done a very good uh, job. I appreciate uh, you coming in uh, today, keeping the uh, conversation, um, you know, very uh, very open. I think you did a good job in explaining to uh, the voters, people tuning in uh, at home, as to what your positions are, what your priorities are, and what you could expect to do if you're elected to the third uh, Plymouth um, House seat. So thank you very much. We thank do you. appreciate thank it. You, thank you. Well Thank you. Done. Thank you.